So yeah, I'm back again. Uh, I don't know, it might be five something in the morning and I'm donning my um, Confederate uniform. Um, and uh, you know, it's but basically I'm wrapped up in wool. Uh, I'm like a little fuzzy lamb, like a little gentle fuzzy Confederate lamb in my wool uniform. And the red signifies that I'm part of the artillery, so. And if you were to look at Union troops, federal or federal troops back then, they would have similar red markings. And if you have yellow markings, your cavalry, I can't remember what infantry is. Um, they might just be plain, but there must be some, there must be some color that signifies them. But uh, Zeke, my grandson and I slept well last night. Um, I came down here at one point last night and ran into some really interesting Cajun style Confederate guys, and man, were they authentic. One guy was about seven foot tall, and I asked him, Did you play basketball in high school? And he said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, probably gets, he probably hates that question. And they both had these awesome big beards, and one guy had feathers, Indian feathers in his head. I think they were, they might have been from Louisiana, because there's people from Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and Louisiana. You know, the thing about Civil War reenacting is that if you have an event, say, um, when I was with the Union 79th New York, which is a Scottish regiment out of New York City, um, we would go to these reenactments, say, for instance, Fort Stevens on Labor Day, Fort Stevens near Astoria. And uh, which, by the way, Stevens was our commander. The guy that Fort Stevens is named after was the 79th New York's commander. And they put cannons there. You Oregonians might not know this, but Oregon territory was controlled at the time by the Union, and they put cannons at the mouth of the Columbia, thinking that the British might enter the war to assist the Confederacy. And they were, I mean, they were on the verge of doing that and committing, I don't know, ships or something to the Confederate cause maybe to sustain their cotton production. I don't know, because the cotton was a huge deal in the textile industry, and especially Northern England. Have you ever seen the movie North and South? Or North and South? I think that's what it's called. It's not about the Civil War. It's about the cotton industry. It's really a love story set in Northern England. Um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good film. It's one of our favorites. Uh, one of the period pieces, you know, that your wife gets you into and you go, ooh, I actually kind of like this. I won't admit it to the rest of the guys, but I actually like Pride and Prejudice and Emma and all of those. Cranston. I, I love all those because <laughs> the, the characters are so interesting, especially the British. Man, they know how to make interesting characters and they don't cast models and perfect looking people. And, you know, they've got people with really crooked teeth and bizarre looking noses and fat, obese people. It's great. I love how they cast. Anyway, uh, last night I happened upon these Cajun guys and they were looking for pizza. And I thought, oh, I feel like I'm in the Twilight Zone. The Cajun, bearded, southern guys from Louisiana. One guy was a friend of theirs and had a Bud Light and, or a Bud in his hand, Budweiser. And that made me think of my brother-in-law who just died, who loved, he, he drank his beer of choice was Bud Light. And uh, he was 64 and he died of cancer and just, it came upon him pretty suddenly. And I'm still really impacted by his death. You know, anytime someone close to you dies, it reminds you of your immortality. And when you get to be in your 50s and your 60s, you start realizing and your parents start dying you start realizing I'm next in line and I'm not kidding you. It's not a joke. You are next in line. <laughs> and then people, your peers start to die and you go, man, how much time do I have? So being here with my grandson, you know, a lot of it for me is about a having a good time with my grandson. Cause you know, that's why I moved here. That's why I yanked myself out of the Edenic, beautiful waterfall, gorge laden, ocean close to you, mountains nearby, snow in the winter for cross country skiing and snowshoeing and no ticks, no copperheads. That's probably the same number of Walmarts, although there are more here, but anyway, there are, Wal there are Walmarts everywhere. So that kind of holds us together as a nation, isn't it? Our Walmart experience. But anyway, that's what it's about. It's hanging out with him, 
and watching his face glow with excitement. And he loves to read and he loves history. I mean, he, he was going on and on about the drive over here because Mickey Mantle is from this area. And we saw a Mickey Mantle um, statue, wooden statue in this. I mean, this is like the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma. This is smack dab in the middle of Cherokee Indian territory. And here we are talking about Mickey Mantle's birthplace. And then there was a boxer. I can't remember his name now, but he fought George Foreman. And he's also from this area. So it's really interesting, you know, you drive through these areas like, we used to go to Wichita Falls and there's just this sign near some town that starts with CH, I wanna say Czech, Czech Qatar, but I, I don't think that's it. And it said home of Carrie Underwood, you know, from American Idol, the one that's made most of the money of all the people I think on American Idol. And she's from Oklahoma. I mean, there's some amazing, amazing people from this area and you know that's what i wanted to talk about is misconception you know i know when i lived in portland and we had a walmart coming to you know kind of hoity-toity sherwood at the time they kind of thought they were the second um like oswego or something because they got all these awards and accolades for being america's most sought after urb or uh, suburb to live in and play soccer or something Anyway, we lived in Sherwood for a while, and it was great. We loved it. I didn't really want to leave until I discovered Newburgh and had way better cycling options in terms of bike lanes and stuff. And, of course, not to mention the vineyards and Shehala Mountain and just the whole, I don't know, just the whole vibe of Newburgh. I just so much preferred over Sherwood. But anyway, um, you know, when the Walmart came in, I remember people in Sherwood thinking, oh, the whole place is ruined now by that blue collar, stinky place where all the weird people come dressed like weird people who just got out of bed. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I kind of like having a Walmart here. It's kind of one-stop shopping for good prices. Now I will say, and I get it, most of the stuff comes from China, like, every, like Amazon stuff does. So don't get hypocritical on me. But, you know, I live in Walmart Central near Bentonville. I mean, I'm like, I'm literally 10 minutes from Bent Bentonville's where Bella Vista goes right into Bentonville. And Bentonville is the headquarters for Walmart. That's where Sam Walton started his little five and dime. You can still see his five and dime down on Bentonville Square, which, by the way, way outpaces Leavenworth. And if you really want to know what outpaces Leavenworth Washington's Christmas show, Try Silver Dollar City. I've never seen anything like that. Look it up on the internet. I'd be, be amazed to compare the number of lights at Leavenworth, Washington, which is great. We've been there, and we, we were with there with our friends, the Lutzes, and they graciously invited us to come along, and we loved it. I loved the German restaurant we went to, and I love the lights. It's beautiful, and I know there's great rock climbing and hiking there, and I'm not trying to put Leavenworth down. I'm just saying by comparison, and again, this goes back to the whole misconception thing that... When I live in the Pacific Northwest, you kind of develop a almost a pompous attitude about where you live and because it's beautiful and the coffee's better and the ocean's better and everything's better. And, you know, you sort of live within that milieu of betterness. And then you come here and, you know, my initial reaction was, wow, there's a lot more poverty here. Yeah, there is. It's like, I think Arkansas is the second most poverty stricken state next to Mississippi but you wouldn't know it where we live because like housing prices are zooming up unfortunately for the locals um and the houses are nice I mean they are nice nice houses and then you get big chunks of property sometimes with your house and we live in a place where there's five golf courses and seven lakes and they're stocked with bass and one has trout in it, and they're, they're going to be awesome. I haven't even tapped into all of the opportunity with kayaking and so forth. But anyway, I was thinking yesterday, I was, just, I, was, I was talking to this guy who was the husband of the lady running the food cart, where, by the way, we were, I, I told Zeke there's gator. He goes, no way, no way, Grandpa. I said, you want to bet me? I'll bet you the price of the food I'm about to buy you. And he said, okay, because he wouldn't believe me that there was alligator meat. And sure enough, we got there. Is this Gator, ma'am? Yes. 
where's it come from? Louisiana. And I looked at him and he's like, yes, <laughs> you <laughs> lost some money, dude. And he said, I said, you don't need to pay me, Zeke. And he goes, you know what, Grandpa, Grandpa I'm going to give you half of what this cost. And it was like 14 bucks and we split it. The poor guy was hungry because we got here last night and all I had was, or yesterday, about 5, 4.30 or 5, we got here. And all I had was jerky. And he's, the poor guy is doing a fast because he goes, you know, he goes to an Orthodox church and they're fasting for Lent. And there's just certain things he's trying to avoid. But I think his mom said, if someone graciously offers it to you, you need to accept it. At least that's the story he's giving me. Well, I'll find out today if that's what his mother really said. But, you know, fasting is one of those things. You, it's your choice. You, you have to, if you're going to do it, then you have to make your own personal choice. But anyway, he's very disciplined with those kind of things. And he's, he's a great altar boy. We went to watch him being an altar boy at his Orthodox church. And that, that was in, it's very different from my church experience. But it was great seeing him. And, he, you know, he flashed us a smile. <laughs> Which is, it's, you know, it's one of those things you just get to experience as a grandparent that's only other grandparents understand. But anyway, I was talking to this guy, and he's a Cajun. And he was telling me about the whole history of Cajuns, which I did not know. And this guy was a walking history book. But again, misperception. If you saw him, you'd think, mm, Walmart, mm, white trash. That's what the basic Portlander would, not all Portlanders, but a lot of the Portlanders I run into. They look down on Southerners and blue collar people to their discredit. I mean, it's embarrassing when you really kind of have a distance from all that hoity toity Pacific Northwest liberal pompousness. It's just, it's so, it, people just reek with it there. And it just, I'm so tired of it. I got tired of it. I'm so glad to be here. But I, I admit, I came kicking and screaming. I did not want to move here because I just thought I had to live on the West Coast. I had to be near an ocean. I started a YouTube channel and I had to have Oregon as my backdrop because, you know, you need the backdrop. But there's lovely things here, too, and, and amazing and very interesting and smart people. This guy, for instance, this Cajun guy, he said that the Cajuns came from France originally. And then they, they came from, I think he said Arcadia was the region or they were Arcadians and then they moved to Nova Scotia in Canada which you know is kind of the French area I think of Canada I think or maybe it's the British area because I know Anne of Green Gables was on Prince Edward Island but Nova Scotia I don't know you guys can help me in the comments is Nova Scotia French or is it British but anyway I can find that out myself uh, he was just a wealth of knowledge about their history and how John Lafitte, the pirate, brought people into Louisiana and basically dumped them off. And so, you know, you know, he he paid they paid him to f find an area, and he basically said, "Hey, this place is lo no law is going to touch you here, so you're free to you're a free man. You're you're in Liberty Land." And you know, think about the attraction of that. <laughs> think about now how people feel, how they're going. You know, instead of calling John Lafitte, they call U-Haul. Do you still have trucks available? Nope. We're out of trucks because so many people are moving. I mean, this is true. I ran into this when we were moving. My wife said, Tim, if we're going to move in the summer, we better uh, reserve. We didn't use U-Haul. We used another company. But we better reserve a moving company or truck, like, way in advance. And she was right. We, They were down to slim pickings by even the time I was about to solidify things and that was four or four or five months before we even moved because there's so many people leaving especially california but they're leaving oregon and washington too i meet all kinds of immigrants pacific northwest emigrants and immigrants and if you leave you're an emigrant and then the people who come here you would call them immigrants so i'm emigrating from ireland but i'm an immigrant in New York City. Anyway, uh, hopefully I didn't confuse that. But anyway, um, he just, and again, misconception. This guy was a walking history book. And I, I just, my mouth was probably dropping because I was just listening to him intelligently and um, deeply 
and articulately explain history to me and teach me things. And I'm not surprised because like the guy we drove over here with, because so, I'm still dealing with insomnia and I've, I've fallen asleep at the wheel, which is scary. And so I've got my grandson with me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to kill my grandson. So I asked if I could get a ride over here because sometimes it's unpredictable when these sleep things come on me. It's like Reagan in his last term. But uh, so anyway, um, you know, it's uh, good morning. But uh, I'm just somebody's going to the bathroom, so I'm kind of coming over here. But um, so his name was Dee Dee, and he worked for a pharmaceutical company, I think Merck. So here's a guy, he worked for the pharmaceutical company. He's a southern gentleman, he's got the great Arkansas accent. He lives in Gravit, which is a small town um, east of us. And uh, he's lived there, I think, all of his life. Uh, and it's a small town. It, I mean, it'd be kind of like in Oregon, it'd be sort of like, um, hmm, rhododendron <laughs> on the way to the coast. You know how small that is, rhododendron or zigzag? You know, one of those little really dinky, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe more like, um, sandy, maybe kind of, but even not, they don't even have that many stores. No, I'll take that back. I'm, I'm going to say they're more like rhododendron. Cause you write, go through town and they, they're trying to fix it up and make it look cool. But it's, he's pointed out this coffee shop. That's where all the men go. And it's owned by a Vietnam vet. And he had a little peacenik guy waving a peace flag and he's a Vietnam vet. So, you know, a lot of those guys after being in Vietnam, they understood why peace was so important. Um, anyway, that's a whole nother episode, isn't it? But let me turn around here. So I got good, decent light. So you're not flashed out by the, but, uh, so anyway, uh, it was a very interesting conversation and I learned so much. And again, this is the thing I'm learning about living in the lower Midwest or the upper South, whatever you want to call Arkansas, Northern Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas. I'm learning, do not ever judge a book by its cover because I'm discovering so many books, deep volume books, war and peace style books, pride and prejudice type books. You know, think of a deep book. Think of like a, a Shakespeare play that's deep, like Hamlet. I mean, that's a deep play. Um, you know, that it explores human nature and indecision and fathers and sons and dysfunction and suicide and I mean, the whole to be or not to be speech, it's a, it's a speech about Hamlet contemplating suicide because he is just confused. Did my dad die naturally or did my uncle have something to do with it? Did my uncle kill my, and what about this ghost that keeps appearing to me? Is that a messenger from Satan or is it really my father trying to tell me to avenge his death because he was poisoned by my uncle while he slept in his garden? I mean, it's a deep play. I mean, if you've ever studied it or watched it, you know, these people here are deep plays. They are Hamlet's and Macbeth's and um, Lear's uh, and Measure for Measure and Merchant of Venice. They're not little light comedy, Mork and Mindy. <laughs> you know, you met people like Mork and Mindy sitcoms or, um, I don't know, pick your most airhead. Mork and Mindy was, I wouldn't say that's an airhead sitcom, but... Compared to King Lear, it's pretty airheadish. But anyway, I better get back because Zeke might wake up and really worry. Where's Grandpa? <laughs> he kind of, he kind of did that last night. He was around the campfire with the other people, wrapped up in a Confederate flag that I found. <laughs> That's a whole another story. <laughs> we are in this town and this is old antique shop, and I realized that no one's selling Confederate flags anymore. They're selling Antifa flags and Black Lives Matter flags, and even Nazi flags and stamps you can get. But for some reason, you cannot find a Confederate flag. I'm talking about like the battle flag, I think it's also called, you know, the stars and bar, the classic one where everybody looks at it and has a visceral reaction to it. Um, but you can't find it, you can't find them. So we go into this antique shop because we're in this town with these foot high ice creams that we're waiting for. <laughs> Anyway, 
that's another funny thing. Watching my grandkids eat these foot tall ice cream cones with foot tall ice cream. Oh man, I don't know if it's early or if I just have the giggles because I'm getting ready to fight the Federals. But he was worried about me and it's because I was waiting in line to get my tamales. <laughs> So I get the tamales and I brought him back and he wasn't interested in anything spicy. So I said, they have gator meat. <laughs> they have gator meat down there. And he goes, what? No way, Grandpa. Because I, I play with his head all the time. I tell him stories. But so anyway, I better get back. This has gone on too long. 20 minutes. Wow. All right. Bye.